Well, good morning, everybody. We are gonna start right out of the gate by answering a question. I want you to think about something during this entire message to be thinking about this one thing and we will come back to it at the very end. But I wanna ask you this. If you could change one thing in your life, Like if you could pick out one thing to change that would affect all of the other areas of your life, what would that one thing be? And I know instantly you're like, win the Powerball, obviously. Cool, finances is maybe what you mean, but no, 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 pick out one thing for real in your life that you would change. Don't make it funny, don't go super spiritual either and give me the Sunday school answer of I just want more Jesus. Cool, that's that's a great answer, but, but be real with it. Like, is it, is it your marriage? Is it your parenting? Is, is it your finances? Is it your job? I want you to think about that for the next few minutes. And while you're thinking about that, let me introduce myself. My name is Robert. I'm the campus pastor here on our Frisco East campus. Want to welcome each and every one of you. And thank you so much for being here with us. Man, you had every excuse in the world. It's spring break weekend. It is daylight savings. Who in the world came up with that demonic idea of daylight savings? I don't know. Last week, Pastor John spoke on giving and you are still here. You are the real Christians. Thank you for being with us. Oh, and if you're joining us online, thank you too. We are so glad uh, that each and every one of you are tuning in with us. We're in the middle of a series that we are calling 99. Uh, We started it in January. It'll run through Easter, and we are talking about the mission and vision here at Hope Fellowship. And just as a reminder, our mission here at Hope is helping everyone to find Jesus and helping them move towards the center of God's purpose for their lives. You've been here at any period of time at Hope. You've heard us use the words love, connect, grow, and serve. That is our strategy of how we're accomplishing this big vision. We want people to know Jesus, for him to be the savior of their lives, and we want every aspect of their lives to start moving them towards the center of God's purpose for their lives. So that for us, that looks like us loving people, looks like us connecting to hope, growing in community, and serving others. Today, we are actually talking about growing in community. And I'm so excited that I actually get to be the one that talks about this. Um, You see, several weeks ago, I made a statement uh, at the end of just the 1115 service that really got uh, a few people talking to me in a way I didn't expect. You know, um, let's just be honest here. I understand my place in this Um, I'm the campus pastor here at the Frisco East Campus where John McKenzie is live. And so at the end of services at the other two campuses, campus pastor gets up, dismisses, they go out to the lobby and they have a line of 10, 15, 20 people that want to meet them and talk to them and shake their hands and tell them how awesome the service was. When we dismiss here, there's a line of like 50 people that wanna talk to John McKenzie and like I get like two people that wanna talk to me and for some reason it's always about my beard. I don't understand what your fascination is with my facial hair. There's only one person that cares about this that really matters, whose vote really counts and that's my wife. She has to kiss this face so her vote counts more than anybody else's. But you know what happened? I uh, stood on this stage uh, several weeks ago. We had Gavin Pappett. uh, He's the pastor of Tribes Church in Argyle, a former uh, staff member here at Hope Fellowship. He was talking about what it means for us to connect with people. And he talked about discipleship and ending up in community. And I stood on this stage and in the 1115 service, I said, you know what? You guys might not know this about me, but I'm an introvert. And I think that surprised a lot of people because they see me up here on stage. Uh, You know, public speaking doesn't intimidate me in any way. I love being up here and doing this. You see me in the lobby, over-caffeinated, really excited, talking to people, shaking hands. I'm very social as a person. I seem to be outgoing. And people confuse that with being extroverted. But the truth is, I'm introverted. Like the end of today, what's probably gonna happen is this evening, I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna wait till it's getting dark out. I'm gonna go outside by myself in my backyard, fire up my fire pit. I'm gonna prop my feet up. I'm gonna stare off into that fire in the big pond behind my house. I'm gonna have a nice strong uh, Coca-Cola in my hand and I'm gonna love it. Like that's where I wanna be. 
But I told everybody I'm an introvert, but I discovered six years ago how much I needed, how much I desired, how life-giving and good, real, deep community was for me. I thought I could go it alone before that. I thought it really didn't matter. It was just this little thing that we did, but community, when I really understood it, man, I realized how much I needed it. And I was actually shocked by the number of people that day came up to me and and wanted to talk about it. Like I probably had a dozen different people after that service want to talk about loneliness and getting connected and being an introvert. I, I quite literally, this is a true statement. I, uh, I walked into the men's restroom to use the restroom and a dude walks up to me while I'm standing at the urinal. And I'm like, man, this is not the place to be talking about your loneliness. This is the men's restroom. You're breaking the bro code. There is no talking in the men's restroom. But in that moment, it really exposed something that I think is going on in a lot of our lives. And whether we realize it or not, whether we understand it or not, or whether we have even recognized it or not, man, we need community. And so many of us are missing it. Like culturally, there's been this word that has popped up over the last few years. It's called relational poverty. Writers and psychologists are starting to study it and use this term. And we understand like material poverty. Like we, we get that. It's you know, lacking access or means to get the things of life that you need to survive. Food, shelter, clothing. We, we, we get all that. But they're starting to recognize there's a piece of our life that needs real relationship, real community, real connection with people. And for some reason, our culture today is missing it. They've done studies over the last um, two, three decades that have pointed uh, at the rise and increase in diagnosed anxieties in people. That depression, clinical depression is on the rise in people. That the suicide rate in America is on the rise over the last 10 to 20 years. Even infidelity, adultery in marriage is on the rise. And one of the reasons that's mentioned over and over and over again in marriage is, man, I'm, I was lonely. They used to think these were all isolated things, but now they're starting to realize there's a thread that runs through it all, and it's this lack of relationship that we have, true community with each other. They actually have a, a measure that they've done for about 50 years to try to track loneliness. And it's, it's called the Cigna Loneliness Index. And they, they go out and they poll and they do all these studies on people. And it is higher now than it has ever been. Which is crazy to me. Like we are supposed to be the time, the generation, the culture that has solved loneliness. I mean, I mean think about it. If you had told your grandparents years ago that you would be able to carry in your hip pocket a device that you could reach out and you could touch a little square and it would pop up and you could search out anyone in the world that you wanted to talk to, that you wanted to share your life with, that you wanted to take a picture and show them what's going on or see a picture and and know what's going on in their life, that you could connect with long lost friends and family members and that person that you left in high school 20 years ago that you hope had forgotten your name but somehow they're still trying to friend you on Facebook you carry it around in your pocket, man, wouldn't they think that we had solved loneliness and isolation? And yet studies are showing that, man, that's not even true. And there's nothing wrong with social media. I don't think it's evil, but it has created this sense of deferred loneliness inside of us where we'll go on and we'll post and we'll throw a picture out there and we'll get 15 or 20 likes and we have this momentary high, but then at the end we realize, man, there's something still missing in us, that there's something not quite right. And I think that something that is missing is community and real relationship and connection. And you know, as us as Christ followers, this should be something that we are good at, that we know about, that we recognize, because like from the beginning, I believe this was built into us. 
Like the book of Genesis, you open it up and in the beginning, God created and he created all of these things and the heaven, the earth, the stars, blah, 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 created the earth, the animals, he filled it. He puts Adam in a garden, he looks down. And what does he say? And it is not good for man to be alone. We as a church, I'll admit, we've done a poor job of really talking about what that means. A lot of times we relate that to marriage and marital intimacy and we kind of create this idea in people that what God meant is everybody needs a spouse. That is not the truth. That is not what I think God was talking about in that moment, like you are somehow incomplete unless you find a spouse. Why? Well, because our biggest example of what it means to be holy, his name was Jesus and Spoiler alert, he was single. When God looks down and said, it's not good for man to be alone, I think he's about talking about our wiring, our need for intimacy and community, not necessarily being married. It goes on from there. You look at the Old Testament as a whole. It is God's dealing with humanity and them trying to relate to him. And it is all in the context of a community. It is all God's relationship to a nation, to tribes, to villages, and how that works out. Then you get to the part of the story where it's Jesus, the New Testament. First thing that Jesus does when it's time for him to step into ministry, he puts a small group around him. He gets 12 guys, we're gonna live life together. You're gonna follow me. We're gonna eat meals together. We get to uh, the book of Acts, the starting of the church. I love it. I love, I love, I love reading about this. It's where we trace exactly what we do today in this room, where we get back to, I mean, how this all started. Jesus said, hey, wait for something to happen. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Then in that moment, man, you are gonna start. So they did. They waited, they prayed, Holy Spirit shows up. Peter walks out. It says that he preached and 5,000 people that day got saved. 5,000 people said yes to Jesus. And then right after that, this happened. We're picking it up in Acts chapter number two. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They came in together into one large group, just like we were doing. And then after that, to fellowship. This is the Christian word for hanging out. They committed as believers to hang out together and to the sharing of meals. I'll give you a hint. It wasn't 5,000 people coming around one big table. It was them realizing in the moment that we can come together as this big group, but the only way this is gonna happen, the only way that this can truly work is if we also break into these smaller groups. So they broke into smaller groups to hang out with each other, to have meals together, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. From the beginning of what we come to do here today, it started with them coming together, yes, but understanding and knowing that they needed close-knit, small community. And it's what each of us need today still. And instantly I know in talking about this with you, I know the pushbacks that I get because I, I hear them a lot. A lot of people are like, but Robert, I already have community. You know, my kids are involved in sports and so that is our community. I'm here to tell you, I like kids sports, okay? I've got nothing against kids sports. They're great. Both of my kids are involved in them. My son just wrapped up his first season of basketball. Proud dad moment in the last two minutes of the last game of the season, he made his first bucket. I was cheering, I was happy. I was high-fiving people I didn't even know. I was asking random people, did you catch it on video? Send it to me. I love kids sports, but that's not your community. That's your kids' community. They are coming together around a common goal, pushing each other, holding each other accountable, helping each other, coaching each other. That is your kids' community. You are there to eat nachos. The pushback then is, but I've got, I got my friends from work. That is awesome. Yes, that is a level of community that you have, but that is not what I'm talking about. It's not just the friends that you go to the bar with, that you have the margaritas with. Why? Because they're not leading to life change. They're leading to more margaritas. 
There's a the pushback, but I've got my workout group. You know what? That is awesome. That is good. You should have that in your life. And if you're part of that CrossFit cult, that is awesome. I'll be honest. I was reading some articles this week on CrossFit. They do community well. They push it well, but it is all about taking care of a physical body, which you should do, which I definitely should do. But it's not the community that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a community that you come together with and it pushes you to be a better person, a better husband, a better father, a better Christian, a better single. A community that can speak life into you and that you can speak life into. All of us are wired for it. All of us want it. And I'm gonna give you three qualities of real community in just a minute. And as we walk through these, I want you to start looking at your life and seeing if you have a group of people that you can do these three things with. Because if you have these three things, and I'm gonna encourage you never to let it go. Never to let it go. And so three qualities of real community that you are looking for, three qualities that you want. Number one, first and foremost, you want refrigerator rights. I know that's weird, write it down. I promise you'll understand it in just a minute. You want refrigerator rights. You can really tell the level of a relationship by where you hang out and the rights you have in their house. Like I've been doing this pastor thing for, for quite a while now and I really like where we're at in our culture now because if people wanna get to know you and connect with you, they invite you out to eat. But in the past, they used to invite you into their house and I've done this so many times. I can tell you exactly what's gonna happen. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna kind of get dressed up like this and I'm gonna go to the house. I'm gonna knock on the door. They're gonna open it. They're gonna usher me into the newly cleaned, newly vacuumed, newly dusted living room. It hasn't been dusted in four years, but you know what? It's dusted now. We're sitting there. We're gonna talk and have some small talk. Uh, at some point, dinner's gonna be ready and you're gonna usher me into uh, the dining room. The first time that dining room has been used for anything but homework and who knows how long. We're gonna sit at the table where the plates are already there. The silverware is already set. The food is going to come out of the kitchen. I'm never going to see the kitchen. It's going to be dropped on the table. Whatever is put in front of me, that is what we're going to eat. We're going to have a great time and the night's going to be over. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. But that's what happens when company comes over. It's a different story when your people come over, when community comes over. Like if we had just met like if your first time was this week and you invited me out to eat and invited me over to your house and, and I came over to your house and like, I didn't like knock on the door. I just like straight opened it and went on in. And then when I walked in, you maybe probably weren't ready for me, but you look at me and you're like, that dude's in shorts and he's got like a holy shirt on. I think he just mowed his lawn. Why is he? And then I was like, hey, what's going on? And I walked into your kitchen where you're preparing a meal and I, I look over what you're making and it's turkey and you don't know this, but I hate turkey. So I'm like, mm, cool, that's, that's all right. I'm, I'm glad you guys can eat that. I'm just gonna help myself. And then I walk over to your fridge and I open it up and I'm like pulling out Tupperware. <sighs> Oh, that's been in there a little long. I'm just gonna put that back. And I start pulling out stuff and I make myself a ham sandwich and grab myself a Coke. And then I just go plop down wherever I want in your house. You might be nice enough to let me enjoy that evening with you. But the moment I walk out of that door, you're gonna be like, that dude is crazy. What is wrong with him? But what happens with community? When my home group comes over to my house, and they have rights to my fridge. They don't knock on the door. I get angry at them if they knock on the door. That means I've got to get up and do something. <laughs> they walk in, they help themselves. They help out even around. Maybe we're fixing things because other people are coming over as well. They jump in willingly. They throw themselves up on the countertops. Some of the best conversations happen in the kitchen around the mess of that life. They have rights to it. Their kids come over to my house and it's a free for all and I love it. Maybe we've made something that the adults like and the kids don't. So mama comes in and she, okay, that's not gonna work for my kids. Open up our pantry, grabs a box of mac and cheese and makes it. And you know what? I want that. I expect it. I think it's awesome. Why? Because it's biblical. Acts 2, did you catch the end? Acts 2 and 44 said it like this. All of the believers met together in one place and shared everything they 
had. When you build, really build community, when you really have that group of people around you, you share everything. Why? Because all of a the sudden, they're, just, they're not just company, they're family. They're family. But it's not just about the stuff. You see, you get to this point in, in a relationship where you realize God may have blessed me with something so that I can bless somebody else. And you're overjoyed that you get to do it. Like, like for our group, man, we get to celebrate each other's kids. One of their kids is receiving an award at school. Guess who's there? We are. And we're excited that we get to do it. My kid's having a sports thing. Guess who's showing up? They are. And they're excited to do it. But you know what? Somebody in our group's going through something. Guess who's there? We are. Like literally last year, family in our group gets that phone call that nobody wants to get from the school. Your son fell on the playground. Something's wrong. He needs to go to the hospital. I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say one text message got sent out. Every wife, every wife from our home group stood up from their desk at work, walked out. I'm not sure they asked anyone. I'm not sure they told their boss. They left that place, went to the hospital, sat with a scared mama who found out her son had fractured his skull. The dads got to take care of the kids and we were, glor- I mean, we were happy that we were able to do that. We did everything we could for this family to make sure it happened. We were praying for them. We, we were there. They didn't even know how to pray or what to pray. All they knew they were scared, but we could be there for them. I've never had to write a $10,000 check for anybody in my group, but if they needed it, If they were going through a medical thing and they needed money, guess what would happen? I would find a way to get $10,000 and give them $10,000. We work together. You know what I did on Friday? Friday's my one day off. One day off that I get and I protect it pretty well. But Friday, I got to move a couple from my home group and I loved every minute of it. Why? Because I knew as I'm putting couches down in their new living room, that those are the same couches where my wife and I are gonna sit and we're gonna talk about real things going on in our marriages, real things going on in their marriages where God is gonna make a difference. I know that that's the house where my kids, when we do our best to parent and they're still angry at us as teenagers, when they're gonna leave and go somewhere, they're gonna go to that house. And those parents at that house are gonna pour into my kids. They're gonna feed those kids. They're gonna take care of those kids and they're gonna give those kids advice. And I'm not even scared about the advice they give them because we're in community with each other. We have refrigerator rights. We share it with each other. I was so overjoyed to help them move. And I love each and every one of you in this place. And if you ask me to help you move, I will show you how to Google movers. <clears throat> that's just the first step. Number one, you need refrigerator rights. Number two, number two, you need to show your feet. That's a weird one, I know. <laughs> if you're first time here, you're going, what in the world kind of church is this? But you need to show your feet. I'll tell you right now, I don't like feet. I, I don't even like my own feet. I especially don't like my own feet because feet are just gross. Let's be honest, they stink, they smell. Some of you have cracks in your heels so deep, I'm pretty sure it looks like the Grand Canyon. Some of you got that fungus that's growing up between the toes. Some of you are like, but I get pedicures. But be honest, you get pedicures because they're painting over the gross part of your feet. (laughs) Feet are gross. Like, I am never without foot covering. First thing I do when I get out of the shower is socks go on my feet. Feet are gross. It's this part of our body that it's socially acceptable to be gross and stinky and to cover up and to not show anybody and it's expected that you would do that. But I'm gonna tell you, we need to get to a place where we're willing to show off our feet. In the Old Testament, there's a story of this guy named Mephibosheth. Really hard name to say, so you just say it with confidence. 
Back then, if you were handicapped in any way, if you were crippled in any way, they thought of it as you had sinned or you had done something or your family had done something and it was God's judgment. It was a shameful thing. It was a thing that was meant to be hidden. If you had a family member who was handicapped in that time, they were locked away, hidden, kept out of sight. It was the thing that people didn't talk about. The, the only times they were really expected to be in public, accepted to be in public is when they were begging for food or money. But there's a story of this man named Mephibosheth and we're gonna pick this up real quick in 2 Samuel. It's this incredible, I wish I had time to dive into this, but I'm just gonna show you this one verse. It's this incredible story. It says, and Mephibosheth, say it with confidence, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. This did not happen in this time period. The only people that were accepted at the king's table were the people supposedly who had it all together, who were the best of the best, the the highest in society, the royalty, almost royalty of the land. And there's this picture of King David having this young man eat at his table despite the social awkwardness of it, despite people judging, despite people looking on. And this is incredible. For us, there are things in our lives that we're ashamed of. There are things in our lives that we cover up. There are things in our lives that we're afraid if we really expose them to somebody, that somebody's going to judge us for them. But I think it is worth the risk for us to finally, with a trusted group of people, sit at a table and share them. Why? Because you want change because you want that thing changed in your life. And if you had the power to fix it on your own, you would have fixed it by now. In our group, it is the first place, it is the only place where I really feel like I don't have to be Pastor Robert, I can just be Robert. It's the only place where people know me in such a way that they can see my faults, they can see my issues. I don't have to keep that shameful stuff covered up because I know they're gonna help make me better. They're not gonna judge me for it. In our group, we've taken risks with each other. We've talked about our broken marriages. We've talked about our our frustrations and issues in raising kids. We've talked about addictions in people. We have helped each other. We have shown each other. We've been real with each other because it goes back to number one. Sometimes God blesses us with things so that we can bless someone else. Sometimes God has given me wisdom on how to help somebody through something. And sometimes he's given them wisdom on how to help me through something, on how to fix, how to change something. We need to risk showing our feet. Romans chapter number 15 says this. There it goes. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given the glory. Now, when I crossed that line of faith, I was broken, I was messy, I had stuff going on in my life. I still do. God wants us to accept each other's mess and junk to help change each other so that he gets the glory. Third thing we see in real community, there's refrigerator rights. Number two, we need to show each other our feet. And the third thing, man, you need to fight lions together. You need to fight lions together. First Peter five and eight says this, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I just wanna point this out. <clears throat> Cats are of the devil. I got Bible right here. Get rid of your cat, get a dog, okay? <clears throat> Have you ever seen a lion hunt? Have you seen and really watched maybe National Geographic on how they hunt, what they do? They hunt for someone in isolation. They hunt for something by itself. Why don't we throw up this video real quick? I've got a little video here. This is a safari, happened years ago, uh, but this was caught on video. This is a pride of lions hunting some water buffalo and the lions are gonna think they win. Here's what happens. Lions checking it out, water buffaloes over here. A few of them are by themselves. They isolate this one calf. They get this calf. They think they have won. The entire pride jumps on this one calf, but the story's not over because this calf had a herd fighting for it and 500 water buffalo come and come over here and go, here, kitty, 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 kitty. (laughs) 
This is a 45 minute thing. I had to cut it down to 30 seconds. At the end of this, they run off every one of those lions. I, you actually see one that gets flipped in the air. It's awesome, it's funny, but you know, didn't want people to get angry at me. <laughs> that calf survives, why? Because that herd fought for it. That herd was willing to fight a lion for it. And if you wanna know what real community looks like, it's being willing to fight lions together because there is an enemy who is looking to isolate and destroy you, looking to consume you. And there is going to come a time in your life where you're alone and where you fall into temptation, where you feel like your world is being crushed down upon you and you have no escape and you will need a community in that point to come around you, to lift you up, to pray for you, to say, we have this. I'm gonna help you through struggling with this addiction. I'm gonna help you through this broken marriage. I'm gonna help you through this divorce. I'm gonna help you even when you think it is all over, they're gonna fight for you. That's community. And that's what you need. We started tonight by asking that one question, that one thing, what would you change? What one thing in your life right now would you change? Some of you thought about your marriage. Some of you thought about an addiction. Some of you thought about your finances. Some of you thought about raising your kids. You need community. Because if you wanna change those things, I believe the best way, maybe even the only way for that to really happen is through community. Like take finances, for example. We have this incredible thing called FPU, Financial Peace University. I can summarize all 10 weeks of Financial Peace University into six words. Six common sense words. Don't spend money you don't have. It's not rocket science, but do you know why we struggle with finances? And do you know why FPU is so successful? because they teach it in a community environment where people are holding each other accountable, where people are showing off their budget going, man, I'm broken, I don't understand this, I keep screwing this up, help me. You wanna know why we're seeing so many marriages fixed here in Hope Fellowship and avoiding divorce? It's because we have a thing called re-engage where people come together in a spot in community and they talk about the brokenness, the messiness, the junk of their marriage and they help each other out. We have region where people are struggling in life and struggling in addictions and they can come in together and see, you know what? We're all broken, messy people. We've all got those things we're trying to hide, but we can come together in community and help push each other towards Christ and somehow they get fixed. Scary part of a, a lot of these studies that I read talking about relational poverty is talking about the 18 to 25 year olds and how they have double the rate double the rate of all of those things of anyone older than them. We have a community of young adults here who are coming together, trying to find their purpose. And you need community. I know you're sitting there and you're thinking today, all that stuff sounds great, Robert. Like, like that's cool, I want that, but it's difficult. How do I get it? I'm gonna give you three quick things. Write these down really quick, three quick things. Number one, you need to put yourself on the path to community. Sounds like common sense, but you need to jump into something. I have so many people who come to my office and want the magic bullet to fix all of the things in their life, and I give them, okay, you need re-engage, you need regeneration, you need a Bible study or a class, you need young adults, you need singles, you, know, you need any of these things, and they're like, no, 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 I want, I want, I want the magic bullet to fix, I'm like, that's it, that's all I got. You need community. You wanna find community? You wanna get fixed? Put yourself on the path of community. Jump into one of those things. But it leads me to number two. When it fails, try again. I'm gonna be honest, it's gonna fail. Probably the first time you jump in, it's not gonna work out. Our first home group here at Hope Fellowship, we were in it for a grand total of about six minutes. It didn't work out. 
I used to run the Grow Ministry here. We did a thing called Group Launch. We still do a thing called Group Launch. It's wonderful. But I can't tell you how many groups, how many people I talked to that went through week one of Group Launch and then by week two had called me or emailed me and said, I can't go back to that group. They're weird. I quite honestly fought the urge of emailing them back. Well, you're weird too. That's why we put you together. Listen, I get it. It doesn't always click, but keep trying. There's so many people here that are in the exact same boat that you are. They want community too. Keep trying. And number three, be the catalyst. Sometimes you are already in these groups of people that are just on the cusp, just on the edge of being ready to jump into real community, but they just need someone to take that first step, that first person willing to say, man, I'm gonna be vulnerable in this moment. The first person maybe to expose, to to take off the shoe and say, hey, I got something I've been hiding. My marriage is messed up. Would you pray for us? Sometimes that's all it takes for a group to really start jumping into life-changing community someone willing to be vulnerable. And so today, as we wrap up, if there was any change that you could make in your life, if I could answer that for you, I would force you to be in community. I would force you to jump into one of these groups. Because as your pastor, I love each and every one of you so much. And I wanna help you move to the center of God's purpose for your life. And historically that has happened through community. It's wired in us. We need it. We want it. Go after it. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Father, we come to you right now and I just say thank you. I thank you that you're this big God, this incredible God who loves us so much or that you're a God who looked down and knew that from the beginning of everything said that, man, it wasn't good for us to be alone, that we needed each other, that we needed community. God, help us to learn to be vulnerable. Help us to share everything we have, all of the blessings that you've given us to maybe bless someone else. God, for those in the room that are maybe feeling like, man, My life is just crumbling down around me. Lord, I ask that you help them find a community that can fight for them when they don't have the energy to fight themselves. Lord, first and foremost, I just ask that you help everyone find that path to great community in their lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.